Hey, what's up, Awaken? This is Jesse, and I'm so glad that you are watching with us today. I just wanted to hop on here and share a little verse before the message, and this is from Proverbs chapter 18, verse 16. It says, A gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. I think this is such an incredible verse because it says that when we give to God, it brings us closer to His presence and it ushers us into the presence of the great. And I just think that's so incredible. So if you want to start your journey of giving today, go ahead and scroll down and click the link in the description. And we are so excited for this message. So so check out this video. God can use anything to turn to someone and say, God can use anything to change your life. He can use anything, even big fish. He can use to change your life. Hey, I got a question for you. Have you ever looked back in your life and, and you, when you look back, you go, man, I wish I would have done a few things different. Anybody in the room? You can talk to me here. This is not a normal church. We talk back, right? We need to say, we're all in this together. Or I'll just preach longer. I don't know. Um, I uh, went fishing this last week. It was my birthday. I turned 45. <laughs> 45? That's so old. <laughs> it might be my last year of softball. I'm, I'm going to start playing bingo, I guess. Um, <laughs> I went fishing and we have this big fishing competition where like the winner gets a big trophy and they talk trash all year long. Now my dad, when he wins it, absolutely is the worst year ever because he will not stop rubbing it in. Uh, So I was out fishing, I caught a monster largemouth bass. Big, I mean just, uh, Riker said, man, that is a big fish. That is a huge fish. We put it in the live well. I pull up. Everybody's there. They're like, oh, did you get any? I got, I got, a, I got the, the winner right here. I reached into the live well. I grabbed it by the lip. I picked it up. Um, I really had it good, so I wasn't worried as I held it over the boat, on the edge of the boat, to, to get out of my boat. Uh, and it went like this. And I had a choice of breaking my finger or letting it go. It was a big fish. I mean, huge. (laughs) One arrow. (laughs) And this is a great point to remind you guys the devil's in the church. (laughs) He comes to the, you know, he's not out there. He's here too, you know. And he doesn't have a right here, any power, but you can hear him sometimes. Uh, (laughs) So I, I have this fish and I'm holding it. I let it go because I didn't want to break my finger. It's so big. And um, when I dropped it, it was still kind of stunned. So I went to grab it. It squirted through my hands. And these young boys in the camp go, we're going to spear it. And so they ran. They didn't get it. So anyways, here's what I regret when I look back. I would never have held that fish over the boat like that because now the winning fish is swimming around Banks Lake somewhere and, you know, I'll never know. The, the, the book that we're stepping into, Jonah, is written by Jonah and it's not Jonah like writing it as it's happening. It's Jonah going back and going, man, I wish I would have realize some things. And he's writing it for us. And God is inspiring Jonah to write some stuff so that, so that when, we, when we read his story, we realize, hey, I don't want to live like that. I don't have to live like that. And, and it's while he was running. It's while he was going away and all the stuff that took place and how God used him and, and how big gra- a, a grace God has. So I just want to pray for everybody in the room. In the name of Jesus right now, we just declare in this room that, that Father, we are a church that's after your heart. We want to go where you want us to go, be who you want us to be. And Lord, we lift up every person that's lost, that's running, that doesn't even know they're lost, doesn't even know they're running. God, would you reveal things that I can't reveal on my own? Holy Spirit, I just ask that you move in the hearts of every person in the room. And Father, let us not leave the same today 
and thank you that the Mariners are going to win the World Series. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to start off Jonah 1.1. It says this, The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. God spoke to Jonah. We're a church that believes that God speaks to people. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus died on the cross, and when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn, and, and Jesus' body that was, that, that was broken, that was pierced for us, is so that we can go directly to the temple. We don't have to go to a priest. We, don't have, we can directly go to God. Why? So that we can be in a relationship with God. And it starts off and says, God gave Jonah a message. God spoke to him. And I want to say God's speaking to everybody in the room. And if you're here today and you're an atheist, we're so glad you came. We're so glad you're in church. You don't have to believe God to be here. But what I would say is God's even speaking to you. Jonah's name means dove, which is sweet, right? Doves fly away from trouble and storms. And so it kind of relates with Jonah because he's the dove guy. You know, the trouble comes. God kind of gives him a call. He's like, I'm going to fly away to this other. How many of you guys know there's another dove in the Bible? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the one where, 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 where God fills our life and things that are impossible become possible. And things that, that, all the things that God has called us to do, <laughs> it happens through the Holy Spirit. But for now, we have Jonah the dove. And Jonah was known as the reluctant prophet. He was reluctant to do what God asked him to do. He's a reluctant evangelist. And who, are, who, who we are as a church and I want to say this very clear, is I want this church to be a church filled with people that run to God, that run to what God asks them to do, that run to the calling that God has given them. Anybody want to be that in, in the room? Yeah. All right. Maybe I, maybe I wasn't very clear. I, I just see it. I see. I want my kids to be like that. I want you to be like that. I want to be around people that are like, oh, my goodness. God spoke to me, and, and, and I, I got to go after what he asked me to do. So I want you to turn to someone and say, I want to do what God asked me to do. Come on, turn to someone and say, I want to do what God asked me to do. I want to do what God asked me to do. I don't want to go the other direction. Jonah 1, 2 goes on and says this. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh, which is really funny. The great city of Nineveh. It's the big metropolis, like it's, it's Babylon, it's happening, it's full of pagan worship, uh, child murder, um, uh, temple prostitutes, uh, barbarians. But this is what God says, hey, get up and go to my great, this great city of Nineveh and announce my judgment against it because I've seen how wicked its people are. It's so cool that God sees something great in a city that's so messed up. Aren't you guys glad that God sees something great in you, even though you're not exactly where you need to be? Like there's something great in everybody. But God doesn't always tell you to do something that you like. Got a little quiet in here. God doesn't always tell you to do something you like or you want to do. I can't tell you how many people have talked to me. God's called me into ministry. I was like, where are you? Uh, into missions. Where are you going to go? We're going to go to Kona, Hawaii. It's like, wow. Like that beach really needs to get reached, you know? <laughs> Just take my shirt off. People come to Jesus left and right. There's got to be a God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't even know where this is. I had a lot of caffeine, so... <laughs> I was saying it in a negative way, all right? But anyways, <laughs> I think there's a Jonah in all of us, and that Jonah is the reluctance to do what God asks us to do. I think there's a Jonah in all of us. I think, I think when God asks us to do some things we don't want to do or, or we don't enjoy, I, I think we can kind of go, well, yeah, you know, we could do other things. Or, or, or how about let's give it time? If we just give it time, maybe it'll go away. Maybe God will change his mind and he'll have another plan for my life. There's a reluctant Jonah 
in all of us, and we could totally relate. Now, let me tell you the people that God is calling Jonah to go, to, to go evangelize to, really. It's Nineveh, the Assyrian. There's full witchcraft and sorcery, sexual immorality, and they believed in this goddess of sexuality and war, but, but ultimately, this goddess was also known for storms. In fact, this goddess supposedly could make uh, rain and thunder and, and, and all sorts of stuff. And God is going to call you to do things you don't want to do, help people maybe you don't want to help. And for Jonah, this means going to this big, the biggest city of that day in a place filled with every kind of evil to tell them what God sees them doing. That's kind of a rough day. Here's what I think Jonah is really thinking. I could die. This is dangerous. Even if I do go, I hate these people and I don't want them to come to God. Uh, Your calling, by the way, is not for you. It's for God's glory. It's not for your glory. It's for God's glory. (laughs) In football, uh, my sophomore year, um, I was on a team. And I kind of see the church as like a team. We're, we're all in this together, and each person has an individual calling that God has your heartbeat beating for so you can do what he planned for you, Ephesians 2.10, long ago. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And we're all on this team. And in football, I was on the team, and they had the gauntlet. And it was a, sp- it was a summer practice. And I decided, you know, I'm going to play. I'm an athlete. I like every sport. And so they lined me up. They picked me. My team, the defense, picked me to go against Derek, Derek Buhner. And, and I was going to have to tackle him. Here's the problem. He was 250 pounds, did steroids, had a slanted head, and listened to Pantera and was mad all the time. And I was 135 pounds, dripping wet. like. And so I did what my team asked me to do. And I ran full speed to tackle him. That's all I remember. I don't remember anything else. (laughs) And I chose not to play football after that. (laughs) But but I I wonder what God's called you to step into that maybe you don't want to do, that maybe you don't like these people or you don't like these things, but God says, no, I'm sending you. I'm calling you. And Jonah 3 goes on and says this, but Jonah got up and went the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa. How many of you guys know when you go away from the Lord, you go down? Where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He, brought, he, bought, a, he bought a ticket and went on board. How many of you guys know when you go away from God, you pay for it? hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. There's, there will always be a boat headed in the wrong direction in your life. There will always be, when God speaks to you, there will always be some friend that shows up and says, or we can go to Kona, Hawaii. <laughs> no, we're supposed to go to Iraq. No, let's go to Kona, Hawaii. You know what I mean? There's always another boat that will show up. In fact, it'll look like there's a bunch of options, but really there's one, doing what God asks you to do. When God speaks to you, there's, there's this other boat. When, when we started the church, um, I'll never forget sitting in Starbucks, doing my usual, like scared to death to talk to people, but opening my Bible, hoping they'd come to me and ask me why I'm reading my Bible. And people called me priests and all this. Day. You're a priest. You're reading your Bible. Like, that's what Christians should be doing. But, but this one guy came up to me and said, hey, are you Daniel? Are you the one that's planted Awaken? And I said, yeah. And he said, hey, I have an offer for you. He said, I know you guys are, I know you're, you're living out of your own, your own savings. He said, I want you to be the associate pastor at my church. I'll pay you to do it. We're a church plant, and I would really love for you to be my associate pastor. <laughs> There's another boat for everybody, right? And in my mind, I'm thinking, instead of living on the savings, I could go be a part of this other vision that God has given somebody, and you know what? I'll just help them out. It's on them, 
It's a lot easier. But in the exact moment, I knew God called me to plant Awakened Church, whether it failed or succeeded. That's what I have to do. And there's no other boat that I could get on. There's nothing else that I could do. That's what I was, that's what I was called to do. And yeah, there's money. And yeah, there's whatever. But that's not, that's not what God called me to. You know, Nineveh was 500 miles away, which is a long ways. So just because it's like not 2,500 miles away, uh, which is Tarshish, 2,500 miles, it's only 500 miles. 500 miles is a long. Anybody walk 500 miles? And I would. Anyway, (laughs) it's not as far as Tarshish. Have you ever realized that it takes a lot of energy to do evil? Have you ever realized when you're doing the wrong thing, the things that God's called you to, have you ever just realized it makes you tired? It's just so much effort. I have a great analogy. Um, I love Dairy Queen. I love anybody else of ice cream with chocolate on it. Come on, put those little peanuts called a peanut buster parfait. I love it. But the problem is me and my wife are on this thing called the keto diet. And we do clean keto, which is no carbs, and the Dairy Queen's not on the keto diet. (laughs) But the devil sends people into my life that try to get me on a different boat than I'm on. Uh, One of these people, I'm not saying the devil, but I'm just saying our worship pastor loves ice cream. (laughs) And and so he'll go to me and say, hey, you want to go to Dairy Queen? It's my treat. And I'll say, nope, I'm on the keto. He's like, are you still, is it a cheat day today? (laughs) And then we'll kind of have a conversation. And then pretty soon it's like, how can, now me and him are having this conversation. How can I get you to Dairy Queen and your wife not knowing that you ate Dairy Queen? (laughs) Sorry, Lord, he has grace for us, Adrian. (laughs) And so pretty soon we're going to Dairy Queen, but then I have to explain to my wife why I got chocolate in my beard. And why I'm hiding things in the garbage so that she doesn't know where I went. I'm like, Adrian was having a real rough day. (laughs) He's having a a rough moment, and I was ministering to him at the Dairy Queen. (laughs) But here's what's even worse. I'm kind of lactose intolerant. (laughs) So even when I do the wrong thing, like I pay for it the next day. But in the moment, I love it. We make life so hard on ourselves. When God calls us to do something great, we end up doing the wrong thing. And then we end up having to try to cover up for all the things that we did wrong. And and pretty soon we get caught in a a web of lies and, and we don't even know what's true and what's not true. And the whole time we could have just not eaten the Dairy Queen and been fine. That's the reality, I think, in a lot of us. If the enemy can just get you to run... If he could just get you to head away from the thing God asked you to do, he can't take your salvation, but what he can take from you is your purpose and your calling and the people that God's calling you to not turning. He could just kill your future. When we run, it seems like there's so many options, but really there's just one option, and that's doing what Jesus asked us to do. There are three things that that ensure to keep me from running away from God. There's three things that that are in my life that really, really help me not get on the wrong boat. Here's the first one, intimacy with God. And I'm not talking coming to church. Coming to church is great. I'm talking sitting in the hot tub, having a conversation with God. I'm talking in the car when I'm driving. I'm talking in my own private time when no one else is around, where it's not this job or it's this, it's just me and God. And you know what I tend to do when I'm out fishing or when I'm out doing whatever? I go, God, who am I? Who am I? God, what, what should I do? I got these things and these things. What do you want me to do? God, what is your heart? Who are you? You need that intimacy. It really changes the perspective that I have in all of the different options the enemy sends. Here's the second one is Bible application. There's a lot of people that are in the Bible. Trust me. They'll come to me. and I actually had one guy at a, pra- a fair, uh, uh, a parade, or, or not fair, uh, uh, 
uh, county fair. He asked me if I read the Bible, and I said, I do. And he said that I'm going to hell. And he had this whole conversation about how I'm not reading the Bible correctly, and I'm not, you know, whatever. He didn't know I was a pastor or whatever. Here's what's weird is there are people that read the Bible, but they don't apply what it actually says. They, they, they have their own opinions and their own thoughts and their own ways. But, but when I read the Bible, it's not just so that I can tell my friends, and hey, God, I read the Bible. It's so I can do what it says. When I apply the Bible in my life, things that are impossible became, become possible. Things that I can't see, the unseen world, all of a sudden becomes my reality, not the things that I can see. Here's... Yeah, and knowing the Bible doesn't change you, it's, it's in the doing that changes you. But the doing comes from Scripture. Here, here's the third one is, is a community of believers. I have a small group. I have a, we have a staff. I have a group of pastors that I walk with in life. And I have a mentor. And, and these people really help me not get on the boat that wants to take me away from the calling God's given me. In fact, their whole thing in my life is to make sure I'm doing what God called me to do. And trust me, I'll show up and they'll say, hey, are, are you okay? And I'll say, I'm good. And they, they'll say, you're not. We know you. And I, and I can't get away with just saying I'm good or everything's fine. And they'll dive into my life and they'll help me get headed in the right direction. Here's the problem. If you don't know where you're going, there will always be someone in your life that knows where they're going, and they'll get you to go with them. So what God wants for us to do is to know what he's called us to do, and to, and to do it. Jonah goes on and says, he, he writes this, he says, But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart, which to me, when Jonah writes this, he's kind of making fun of the God, the goddess of, that makes the storm. He says the Lord made the storm. The Lord was the one that brought the wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that, that threatened to break the ship. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their God, their gods, for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship, which I just have to tell you this story. Somebody donated a, 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 a boat to the church last week. And our youth pastor and the children's pastor uh, were in the boat. We, we nicknamed it the Dingleberry. And it sunk. And I was trying to find them. And I went to pull up. And there was a, a like minefield of Coke Zeros that had been thrown overboard, along with the battery that was supposed to run the electric motor, trolling motor, and they had thrown everything out trying to save the boat. And when I read this, I just think of those guys. Don't worry, they'll preach about it real soon. But they're throwing this stuff out of the boat. They're throwing, trying to lighten it. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused the terrible storm. And when they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. I love that they identified Jonah, and so in the midst of a storm where the ship's almost going to be ripped apart, they decide to have a conversation. Why has this awful storm come down on us? They demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? And Jonah answers, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The sailors were terrified when they heard this, for, they, for he had already told them that he was running away. You can bump it up. For he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop this storm? 
God maybe uses storms to wake up people. Has anybody been woke up by a storm? You don't want them. But God sends storms. I want you to realize it doesn't say the devil sent this storm. And I've talked to people, and they're like, the devil has sent this thing in my life. And the whole time I'm sitting there thinking, I think God's trying to wake you up. And Jonah thinks, he's thinking, hey, the further I get away from God, the further I get away from the calling, maybe the easier it'll be to deal with it. Maybe the further I run away from God, the less I will have to worry about the thing that he's asked me to do. Here's the problem. God finds him in a boat going the wrong direction. God finds him right where he's at. I'll say this to you. God will find you right where you're at. You think you can get whacked out on, on, on weed and God won't find you at a weed party? He will. You think you could be at a bar and start getting drunk and God won't find you? He will. God will find you on the boat that you got on that was away, not to condemn you, but to remind you of who you are. He falls asleep in his calling. Gosh, the church has been asleep for a while. People have fallen asleep. They've forgotten what got us here. They forgot that every town in America that started, it started with a church that was built because the town needed to be built on the Lord. Got a little far off of that. Some are sleeping on what God has spoke to you. And you're sleeping, but man, God, God has called you to something great. And the wind of the Holy Spirit is about to wake you up. And the wind of the Holy Spirit is supernatural. It doesn't make sense. It's clearly not just a storm. It's God trying to get a hold of you. The Lord sends the wind to hit sleeping Jonah's boat. And the wind, the crew knows is spiritual. The lost people know it's spiritual. Everybody around knows it's spiritual. The wind awakens one thing in Jonah, and it says identity. I wish you would have your identity awoken if you're on the wrong boat. Jonah, remembering Jonah is telling this after the fact. If you remember this, he's telling it after the fact. And Jonah is trying to say, hey, in the storm, I was sleeping. And when I was woken up, I remembered I'm a Hebrew. I remembered... I remembered who I am. I worshiped the Lord. I remember that the Lord that I worship created everything. He made the earth and the sea. And I'm going the opposite way. Why? What is Jonah wanting us to know? Our calling really matters. Do what God's called you to do. Step into it. Could some of the storms be your fault? or someone else's lack of following God? The answer is yes, we read it in the story. Some of the storms in your life could be people that that are just going the opposite direction. You're like, oh my gosh. Some of them could be us, but either way, it's God just calling us back to him. How many know that we have a God who can make a storm that wakes sleepers? I'm just thankful. We have a God that can wake up a sleeping church, that can wake up a sleeping believer. We have a God that can do something to get you to realize your identity is not in the things of this world, but it's in the God of the universe that made everything. That's who we are. Jonah 1.12 goes on and says this, throw me into the sea. Jonah said, it will become calm again. That's so confident. I know that that this terrible storm is all my fault. Did you know that this is what grace is? It's when you come before God and you don't go, God, why is all this stuff happening to me? But you go before God and you say, God, I'm the problem. And I need you as my Savior to save me. I need your help. That's why Jesus died on the cross. The blood on his hands dripping. 
He's our Savior. He's the one that saves us because we were the ones that have sinned. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's a show called The Mole, and they'd have all these people do these tasks, like, like they build a house or they build whatever. But one of the guys on the team was a mole, and the mole would constantly ruin everything that they were trying to do, and they were, they'd have to try to figure out who was the mole. Man, Jonah's the mole. But I wonder in the church if anybody in the room has been the mole. What God's called you to do, you didn't do. But the team needs you to do it because God called you to do it. And no one else is called to do it but you. You have to step out and be who God's called you to be. And by not doing it, you end up sabotaging some of the mission that God has. Here's what we know about Jonah is Jonah knows it's safer in the water than it is on the boat. It kind of reminds me of Peter. Where is it safer to be in the storm, walking towards Jesus on the water or sitting in the boat with the disciples? Man, when you're walking, remember the God that's just walking on the water going, okay, come on out. And all the disciples are freaking out. The safest place is in the will of God, not in the boat. This is something that you can't see that God has to give to you. This is not with your own eyes. This is with the things that we can't see that we're supposed to see. Why why is it safer? Because God's calling Jonah back to him. Jonah 1, 13 through 17 goes on and says this. Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get to the ship to land. But the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God, O Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's... You can go up. Don't make us die for this man's sin, and don't hold us responsible for his death. O Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked up Jonah, or picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea. And the storm stopped at once. Can you just imagine this? They take Jonah, chuck him over, and boom, it goes quiet. And the sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. When they got Jonah out of their boat, the storm calmed calmed. It was safer without Jonah. Some people in the church need to get the Jonas out of their life. This doesn't mean we're judging people and we're saying, oh, they're, they're lost forever. This just means, man, some of the storms that you're in are because you got people in your life you know you shouldn't have in your life. That person's always in a storm. But here's the other thing that we learn. When they throw him out of the boat, Jonah finds his calling in God. If Jonah doesn't get thrown out, he'll never become who God is calling him to be. And this is how God works. Jonah runs, God sends a storm, the crew throw him out, and he becomes the evangelist vowed to follow God anywhere. God's grace can use us right where we're at. If we just woke up, Here's what I know is you could be in a worse situation running from God and boom, wake up, and that bar that you shouldn't be in all can find Jesus because in that moment you decided to turn to him. God's grace will find you exactly where you're at and he'll use you right there. Jonah 1.17 goes on and says this, Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, not a limousine, or, or a camel, or a fish. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Man, God has a big fish for you today. If you're here, and you've been on the wrong boat, and you know that you need to step into the calling that God has for you. Here's what's so cool. The Lord has already arranged for something great for you. Maybe it's not exactly what you wanted, but it's exactly what you need. If you head back to God, he'll provide the ride. If you turn to God, he'll provide the ride. He'll provide the means to get you to where, what you're supposed to do. And if you know this, if you're running 
and you turn to God, God will give you a three-night stay, all expenses paid. (laughs) It just might make your skin turn white for the rest of your life. We don't know, but big fish. This is salvation. This is salvation. I just want to sum it up. There's no place that God's grace can't find you and save you. I was on a boat in Bristol Bay, Alaska, and and, and I was out fishing. We were commercial fishing. And I was, before I had left, I was with a girl that I shouldn't have been with. It was against what God called me to. It was against everything my parents have taught me. I knew I didn't, this girl shouldn't have been in my life. And I was on the boat and we had been fishing for a week and the whole time we were fishing, all I could think about is what do I do with this situation because I shouldn't be in it. And I remember thinking if I just stop and say, God, if you don't want her in my life, I just give her to you. And I couldn't do it because I knew if I prayed it, God would do it. And finally this one night, I prayed the prayer. I said, God, if you don't want her in my life, I had to just took, I had to think about it. I was like, I just give her to you. Boom! The captain comes down. Hey, they shut the season down right now. We're going into port. I like, you gotta be kidding me. We go into port, we take a shower. I get on the phone to talk to her. And she says, Hey, I think we need to end it. And I said, no, 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 we can work things out. She said, no, I'm ending it. I wonder if I didn't take the time to stop and say, God, you do something I can't do. God, I give you my life. I give you my future. I want to turn to you. I wonder what would have happened in my future. If Jonah could teach us anything, it would be, if only we could stop running and start turning to a God of grace. God's grace is so big for people that run that he finds us in a storm that we shouldn't be in and he saves us. But here's, I'm an evangelist, so in my head, I hear the city of Nineveh just crying out. I hear lost people killing children, having sex parties, doing all of this stuff that the world says is good. And I could hear these people going, there's got to be something more. And God goes, okay, I'm sending Jonah. I'm sending Jonah. Jonah goes, I don't want to go. And there's all these people that need to know the amazing grace of God. If only Jonah would do it. Maybe today someone's running and that voice that God has been calling you to, you cannot outrun it. What I say for you today is maybe today's the day that you turn to God. You say, God, I give you my life. He's asking you to turn to him, to be set free, to be healed, to know without a question of a doubt who you are, your identity in heaven. So I'd just like you all to bow your heads for a sec. Man, if you're here and you've been running, and you don't know what God's saying to you, I I would just say this. You can ask him right now, but I wonder how many people are running from what God asked you to do. Maybe it's not something you want to do. Maybe it's not something that you enjoy. But it's just right. And maybe because of your running, you're sitting in here today and you feel like you're going to hell. You feel like the way that you are living is you do not feel like hell is... Like, like, like heaven is secured in your life. So I want to just take one thing off the table today. If you're here today and you have a question of a doubt that you're going to heaven, and today you would just like to say, hey, I'm sick of running. I'm sick of running from God. I'm sick of going the opposite direction. And today I just want to say, God, I give you my life. I want to turn to you. I want to do what you want to do. Give me the easier life. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand with every every head bowed? If that's you in the room, you need to turn to God. You want to have heaven secure. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you guys. I see you. We're going to pray this prayer right now. Would we all just pray? Jesus, 
I give you my life. Lord, I, I know that I'm the problem, but you died for me. You met me where I was at. You pulled me out of the storm. God, you put my feet on solid rock. I give you my life and I give you my future. Speak to me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give it up for the people that prayed that prayer today?